it's a group of students who are all equal. They came together at the same time, at the same place. The White Rose Resistance Movement distributed leaflets, splattered graffiti on city walls, and risked their lives for a cause which they believed to be just. A quote which ended their fourth leaflet seems to accurately sum up the mentality of the group. We will not be silent. We are your bad conscience. The White Rose will not leave you in peace. A triumphant truth rings in their words which still echo through our minds a full 70 years since the guillotine split them apart. In 1933, when Adolf Hitler came to power, most Germans were thrilled with the change of direction. While more previously subdued, anti-Semitism was allowed to flourish with the change in leadership. Under the careful eye of the Führer, changes quickly became more radical. Soon, it was not just the Jews who were being taken away and restricted, it was anyone with an opinion. By 1942, a group of college students and their mentors at the University of Munich, who could no longer stay silent against the atrocities which were being committed, formed a movement that became known as the White Rose. They hoped to spark a revolution against Hitler. Their unusual name and brand, considered in German literature to be a death flower, sparked from an inspirational letter by Fritz Rook a friend of one of the members. The letter spoke of how, White flowers are for the dead, but death, love, and youth are all one and the same. Even after their brand had been decided, the group never referred to themselves as the White Rose. That was a title which would be used by modern-day scholars to describe the small group. White Rose, which was a very small group, altogether perhaps 50 people, young people. Only a select few out of the total group actually participated in the active resistance measures. Of those students, Hans Scholl, Sophie Scholl, Alexander Schmoll, Christoph Probst, and Willy Graf are often most recognized for their work. Willy Graf overcame some of the greatest hurdles. His devoutly Christian beliefs initially restricted his revolutionary actions. He asked himself, can I as a Christian assassinate Hitler? That's murder. Murder is forbidden. There was no out, but he convinced himself finally, despite his faith, that Hitler was so evil that assassination or that murder was justified in that sense. After this point, Willy Graf pushed for a more aggressive approach. However, the others were hesitant to involve the military in matters which they believed could be solved through passive resistance and nonviolence. Hans and Sophie are often considered to be the leaders of the White Rose, but they had to undergo a large reform before they reached that frame of mind. As with many of the others who were raised on the principles of Nazism, the Schulls were avid members of Hitler Youth. For Hans, the stark change in perspective most likely occurred at the Nuremberg Rally of 1936. When seeing the men's total uniformity, he was repulsed by the idea that he might have to act like them. The same type of change happened to another revolutionary associated with the White Rose, a woman named Lilo Drayfield. I'm a friend of National Socialism. I think that's uh, perhaps important because that was the uh, evolution that uh, other people also went through. Once at the University of Munich, Hans Scholl met up with others who shared his revolutionary views. This was usually a hard thing to accomplish because all activities were strictly monitored by the government. Even party members worked against dissenters by closely watching their actions and reporting to the Gestapo. The communication was the big problem why no movement could reach farther than maybe the, as far as the city. The student medical company, a military unit which Hans had been assigned to, offered a way around that. The majority of the soldiers were like-minded individuals who made up the inner circle of the White Rose. The entire movement likely began in the group's barracks as referenced by a quote from Alexander Schmorl. Maybe ten years from now there will be a plaque on the store which will read, this is where the revolution began. Others such as Sophie Scholl, Trout LaFrance, Professor Kurt Huber, and Lilo Ramdar joined the likes of the student soldiers. Trout LaFrance reached out to a group in her old town of Hamburg, for she knew their sympathies lay away from the Nazi party. The Friends of the White Rose might have expanded even further had it not been for the fear of being apprehended or betrayed. Most, like Lilo Drayfield, would not even vaguely mention the acts. I asked her, and her answer was, uh, Armin, I, I rather not answer that question. And uh, the reason for that is that the 
any knowledge alone of any such activities uh, would uh, really jeopardize you. Mentors of the group also played a key role in the resistance. When Manfred Eichemeyer came back from his work in Poland and told the students that 50,000 Jews had been murdered, they were shocked. This compelled them to tell everyone that Germany was committing crimes against humanity. At this point, the group progressed from private discussions to active measures. They began their resistance with a leaflet campaign that consisted of six different radical leaflets which spoke to the evil nature of the Nazi party. While the writings were mainly focused towards the scholars at the University of Munich, the group did extend their reach outside of the city. Through a series of complex mailing routes, they attempted to keep the police from pinpointing the origins of the resistance and to make it seem as if the group were larger than it actually was. Among the student body in Munich, reaction to the leaflets was tremendous. This resistance was the first seemingly wide-scale act against the regime in Hitler's supposed home base of Nazism. The White Rose is the only resistance to have documented Nazi injustices against the Jewish community. However, others outside of the university did not respond so positively to the intellectual pamphlets. They thought, I think, that if they published these leaflets, that their German neighbors would be so incensed that the whole city would take to the streets and would protest and would overthrow Hitler. However, when they did it over and over and over, when, you know, by the sixth leaflet, their form of resistance wasn't having the proper outcome. And so, in the beginning of February 1943, they changed their tactics to become more radical. Sophie Scholl came up with the idea for a graffiti campaign. Words such as freedom and down with Hitler were painted all around Munich by Han Scholl, Alexander Schmarl, and Lily Hall. Between the leaflets and the significantly more dangerous graffiti campaign, the leaflets brought the harshest backlash. On February 18, 1943, Hans and Sophie Scholl paraded down to the university's campus with a suitcase filled with leaflets. They scattered the leaflets throughout the hall and, in a split-second decision, threw them off the balcony into the crowd of students below. But their act of courage turned into an act of youthful naivete after a janitor caught them. They stood there. They did not move. They stood there until he puffed and puffed up three flights of stairs to get to them. The Gestapo reacted that day by arresting Hans and Sophie Scholl, as well as Christoph Probst, who was incriminated by the leaflet draft which Hans had in his pocket. On February 22nd, Judge Ronald Freisler led a biased trial consisting of unheeded ranting and a non-existent defense. Judgment was swift and ended with a sentence of death by guillotine. There were three White Rose trials in all, which ended with a death sentence for several and a jail sentence for most others. Some Germans could not bear to let the message die. The university's chemistry department helped Hans Leipold, a student unassociated with the White Rose, to reproduce and distribute the final White Rose leaflet shortly after the first trial. While most Germans had no reaction to the department's act, the Gestapo did. In 1945, Leipold was sentenced to death while others from the department, like Lilo Drayfield, were dishonorably discharged from the university and given jail sentences. Reaction inside Germany was muted, but others outside of Germany took note of the students' heroic acts. The prestigious New York Times published three articles in 1943 that brought awareness of the White Rose situation to the United States. Of course, the United States and Germany were at war at the time, and so any rebellion against the regime inside of Germany were welcome in the United States. But I think it's just an uh, admiration for the people like this. The Allied forces also noticed the acts of the White Rose. Midway through 1943, British planes dropped the group's final leaflet all over Germany. Alas, there was not much reaction to this final distribution, and the papers of the resistance lay metaphorically untouched on the streets. The White Rose wanted to be the spark of a revolution in Germany against Hitler. Their youthfulness was an asset in the sense that they were willing to take risks, but it also made them unprepared for the challenges they would face. By bringing the plight of the minority to the attention of the masses, they managed to set forth a precedence for future resistances. However, their words did little more than cause their deaths at the time. As said in a quote by Hermann Krings, the former president of the University of Munich and a friend of Willy Graf's, the signs from those days are still signs today. We must interpret the signs of the White Rose. 
How shall we understand them?